for this session, we have four uh, lightning talks and two talks. So, uh, I first introduce Jesse Peck. Jesse Peck, and he is a soft developer uh, with the digital library of Stanford University. And he's going to talk about implementing schema that works in Stanford discovery environments. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so I'm uh, just here to talk about some work that we did uh, last, uh, not answer, I don't want to present, uh, some work that we did last year in, um, in our Blacklight based discovery environment, SearchWorks. Um, so, uh, we wanted to expose all, all of the records in our catalog via schema.org. Um, so the approach that we took, uh, and there's various ways that you can represent information uh, uh, via schema.org markup. Um, it seems that we kind of landed on one of the um, emerging best practices being uh, a, a script tag um, with the application uh, JSON LV embedded into the page. Um, there's uh, you know, various uh, microdata formats, and you can have a separate URL with the representation. Um, but this is kind of what we landed on through uh, some, some research into um, at least what uh, search engines were saying that they would be looking for and potentially using. Um, through some uh, consultation with uh, uh, some data-minded folks at Stanford and uh, Penn State, um, we decided that a, a good initial approach for the broadest set of our records would be to do kind of a simple um, title format author mapping so that a uh, crawler like Google, uh, as they were indexing um, our discovery environment, would be able to start getting more structured inference data about what is actually there, um, as opposed to what they can and do infer directly from the markup itself. Um, so uh, as you can see, I'll kind of discuss kind of briefly what we've, what we've done here. Um, this is a, a really simple JSON-LD snippet. Um, I'll just kind of talk about the type here. If you're familiar with a blacklight catalog, um, you might be familiar with something like this, which is a format facet that is common in, um, in many of them, and I think is one of the facets that you get out of the box with the example data. Um, so this is basically the set of formats that we have available to us that we've mapped every single record in, the, in our catalog for the most part um, to. So um, we then took those and made mappings from of those to schema.org classes. So for every one of these, we talked with uh, folks in our, in our metadata group um, to determine for the way that we uh, take mark or mods data and distill it into uh, a set of formats, how do those then map over to schema.org types or classes? Um, so that was uh, ended up being very, very useful. Um, so I'm just showing a book example here, but for every one of these things, uh, we, we will have a specific type that we will, um, in schema.org, that we will um, represent it as. Um, so back to the example. Um, so what we've done here is this is all simple solar field to schema.org mappings. Uh, the reason why I make that uh, distinction is because our goal will be eventually to extend this or to put this out so that other people can use that. Uh, the same information and can very simply configure uh, the fields in your solar index that would map to these other things. Um, and you know, we'll have some example code that I won't show in this lightning talk, but uh, that is available since this application is completely um, open source. Um, so as I mentioned, we also um, brought are bringing in the name, uh, and then we are bringing the author. This is just a person, but we do you know handle corporate authors and um, kind of various flavors of authors and also can map those to particular um, types in uh, schema.org parlance. Um, OK, so that's cool, title and author. Um, that's not really going to cut it. Um, so uh, the strategy that we have for enabling richer schema.org support is by doing this in our index. So um, kind of really briefly, if, if there is a schema.org data in your index, we will pull that. Absent of that, we will do our simple solar field to schema mapping um, so that you can get that title author for everything. But for anything that you want to do a deeper dive into, um, we think that that should be a concern of your index. Primarily because your index, your indexing pipeline is probably the place where you have access to your repository, the files in them, 
uh, and, and the like, which is where you're actually going to be able to drive these richer descriptions. Um, so as you can see here, um, I have a data set uh, about the Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve uh, in, uh, in California. Um, and we are actually able to, uh, in this case, although it might not be the best example because um, it's a zip file, but uh, we are actually able to describe the data uh, for this specific thing too. So not only are you able to get some bibliographic information, but you can actually, through this record, get directly to the data itself. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, because it's in the index, we really have the flexibility to do whatever we want with the data because we, can, we have access to the content. Um, so kind of the next steps for this sort of thing, as I mentioned, this, is, this implementation is initially done, we're kind of validating it in our environment, SearchWorks. Um, but, uh, so some of the things we'll be doing locally, we'll want to um, make kind of more richer solar field mappings to schema.org mappings, so maybe we can do more than just author and title. Um, again, locally, we would like to do a deeper dives into other data sets, but potentially even um, tabular data, which uh, Google says that eventually they might start putting that into their search results. I, I might not hold my breath, but um, they are doing that with certain um, like news organizations, and you can actually pull in tabular data right into search results in a kind of a knowledge panel. Um, and then uh, richer descriptions of other schemas and classes. Um, you know, we, we have a small subset of what we have, but uh, what we mentioned, but there can obviously be um, uh, kind of richer, deeper dives into the other, other types of things. And um, as I said, I, this has just been in the uh, SearchWorks application as a validation, but one of our real goals is to make this uh, either a core piece of Blacklight functionality, um, or at the very least a plugin that if you wanted to opt into this sort of thing for your Blacklight catalog, um, you would be able to do so for the uh, kind of the simple mapping use case. And then, uh, as I mentioned, all of the ability to do richer dives through, through your indexing pipeline would be a bit better there um, for you so that um, you could surface your data to uh, people that are calling your catalog for um, schema.org information. Thank you. So, so there's, there's kind of there's, there's two, two bits to it. Um, the, this, this, the simple example where I showed just the author and title mapping would be um, the author and title data existed as flat fields. You have a title field. We map that to this is, you know, this is what you should put in that title field. Uh, here's where my author is in solar, kind of flat, as, as in a uh, typical kind of the way you think of a solar index being, uh, being configured. Uh, but the, uh, um, the way to get the richer, deeper dive into like a data set, the way that that's done is we have a solar field that actually has the JSON, the JSON LD payload in it. So the entire JSON LD payload is in a solar field um, that we can pluck out and just render that as opposed to doing the mapping. Okay. Um, and what are you finding? So, so one of the questions that I always have, I, I always think it's good to do this no matter what. Like I don't care if we return it to Canter, right? Um, but um, I also wonder what's the utility of putting strings in schema.org versus should, should I just stick to data that, that can be expressed with URIs? Um, what's really the point of putting a string in there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the goal, um, albeit we're kind of at the whim of those, uh, the powers that be that, can, that consume this data, um, but kind of one of the use cases that we're looking at that doesn't exist right now, we're hoping does in the future, is that um, uh, Google's doing this with certain um, news organizations where they can surface tabular data um, in their schema.org markup right in the page, and then um, they will actually render that for the user if they're, they're if that entity comes up in, your, in their search results. Um, so particularly with the deeper dives, 
the, our, our goal is to be able to have other environments that are indexing our data and display that data more richly, as opposed to just like a title and a, and a, and a description. Um, now, actually seeing that in the real world is unfortunately not up to us, but um, you know, surfacing the data out there, we're, we're hoping that the, uh, as people see that there are institutions out there that are doing that, that there might be more drive to um, actually consume and use that data in a useful way. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a question. So you have, first you study with the name, and then you, you use the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so first you study with the name, and then you added more details into schema level uh, mapping. So what are the decision making process for that kind of decision? So what kind of information should be represented in schema level and why not? Because I don't think everyone, everything should be represented in schema level, or schema level but I want to know what is key information you think to be represented and what is the reason? Um, yeah, so um, well, definitely the, the, the base case of being title and author I think is, is actually extremely helpful because that is information that sometimes they, the, um, a search engine indexing the HTML of your page might not understand. Um, as far as the kind of the richer deep dives, I, the things that I see that potentially are interesting or I think are data sets. So I'm really interested in representing the actual data of data sets or the files of data sets so that um, external consumers uh, are not only getting bibliographic data, but they can actually do things with the data set. They can download the data um, and then either use it or do direct uh, visualizations of that data if we can represent the raw content in schema.org. Um, so that's one of the um, kind of key ones that I find most interesting. Thank you again. I think oh. also help answer that question. <laughs> um, the data set search team at Google is its own separate team under AI, and they have guidelines for box on. I'm sure getting up the page, but I can find it. Um, they have guidelines on best practices, especially for describing books. Thank you.
it's thinking of it as like what's the most efficient? What is the easiest to do? Like for us, everything in Silicon Valley is an optimization problem. So the easiest thing is getting the pre-made macaroni and cheese at the Whole Foods Hot Pot, right? And so the bibliographic record just needs to represent all these things. Like this is who wrote the book, and here's all you need to know about it. And when we think about it at an aggregation level, because we get so many records, we have I think about two billion records um, from hundreds of sources, we have to think of efficiency. It's just computationally expensive to keep looking these things up, keep comparing them. If it can all be represented in a single bit record, that's the best. So then the, uh, the part of the right is just an example, but I'm sure you've all seen a version of this. And then the last thing I want to touch on is this idea of co-occurrence and redundancy. Um, this means a lot just at Google in general and how we organize things on the internet. The more things occur together, the more it means. And then the more often that happens, the more it means. Um, so I want to caveat this by saying, this is just an example. Right now, repeated zeros are not necessarily allowed in MARC. They might be, they might not be. But just, it's more the concept than the actual implementation here. But the more that we see that id.look.go URI appearing with the WorldCat URI, appearing with the Wikipedia URI, the more we treat it as what we call a strong signal and the more it's trusted. Just having it once, like in an authority file, doesn't give it that much meaning. But if we see all of these links appearing together over and over and over again in all of your bit records, it will be treated as a stronger source. And then same thing with a work record, um, or like a work manifested record. The more we see these things over and over again, the more they mean, and the stronger system, or the stronger signal they'll send, and the more we'll trust them. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Always, as always, feel free to email me. Thanks, Aaron. So a lot of us are here because we'd like to get library data onto the web, and I think you've just talked about better ways to do that. We also like to get web from the data into the library. Do you have any examples where libraries are incorporating Google Knowledge Panels, Google Auth Panels, or Book Carousels into their environments? No, I actually don't know of any way that our data is exportable. It's like we're basically recreating all of the data in our own format at Google in the graph, and then it's currently just, it's just sitting there. Trapped? Yes. Trapped in Google? Intentionally. So for the uh, flows of data into Google, um, I, don't, I don't recall if you had schema.org data on the web um, getting pulled in. So, you know, a number of us, like Jesse just presented, have done the work of representing the market bibliographic data as schema.org um, in the hopes that search engines would actually take that as a feed, but that's not a signal at this point. Yeah, in um, a longer version of this presentation, I clarify that, but since this is a lighting talk, but yes, I was Speaking specifically to things we get as a manual ingestion or a manual feed um, that we work, it's like a one on one relationship with everybody. And then the what we call the tech blue links, that web search people, that's a totally different group. And then the data set people I mentioned a few minutes ago is also a totally different group. So that's why I know it can be kind of confusing. But yeah, no, we're not books as a product at Google is not like currently utilizing any sort of schema or crawling or scraping. Um, I found your example to be very illuminating, and so maybe I'm taking it too literally, but you know, let me know. But the um, it seems to me that adding, for example, those four four uh, URIs into a Mark bibliographic record, um, I can automatically recognize the strength in terms of confidence it would give you guys when you're looking at it. But it seems to me that it places a lot of onus on us 
to get those four in there. And we've done that in the past. I mean, VOV is a phenomenal example of this, but VOV is also its own pro um, project where they've devoted huge numbers of hours to <coughs> being able to populate um, their resources with all those URIs, whereas when you look at us individually um, as libraries, we don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to do that. Now, I know that once it's in there, they don't get deleted. Um, so I recognize that. So I guess where I'm going is, one, have you guys considered when you find just one of those URIs in it, one from a WorldCat or one from ID.load.gov or one from VIOP, um, just automatically giving that more confidence, one, and then two, take VOF or, or ID, uh, you can go to those two locations and very possibly find those other URIs that uh, assert some form of exact match or similarity, um, which would allow you to infer the confidence. Now, I recognize that you end up going to two or three grocery stores for it. Um, but you could also download those data sets and kind of, you know, on a, on a monthly basis and put them in the systems to make that a little bit simpler. Yeah, it's, it's always a balance of confidence in the source and easily digestible data. So I think that's the, always the push and pull between library data. I'm always asking for more structured data from libraries because we have such high confidence in it. We know it's expert and we know there's humans behind it. Um, I don't have a straight answer for you, but it, the, yeah, I agree. We, we do it just by F, and it does end up in the graph. There's a lot of same as relationships there. It's more at the bit record or instance level where we can be absolutely sure redundancy is always better. If, if we're not sure, we usually throw it out. That's the other issue. Better to be completely sure than get it wrong. Okay. Um, so just, just following up on Kevin's point, I think that what's happening right now, the, the revolution in the library community, <coughs> is to be doing less um, and, and expecting programs and, and programmers to do, and software to do more. Yeah. And, and it sounds like we're going in opposite directions. Yeah, and I, I have heard as much um, from the librarians. <laughs> I would say it's, it's still, not, we're just not at that right confidence. Like I, we can aggregate and say, get all these signals from all over the web. I feel like as the state of the internet, we would not feel that like we could confidently give you back a data set that says all of these entities around the web are the same thing. Does that make sense? It, no, it does. So, so what could we do to help you have confidence in the sources that we have confidence in? So, for example, ID.bot.gov or or BIAP or or Disney or can can the library community say to you? Um, so so these are the sources that um, that we have confidence in their authoritativeness and, and and that they should be given a higher a high ranking or, or you know um, higher level of confidence by Google. Would that would Google act on that? I would say that I already like make that case now. It's like I can tell them which are authoritative, like I buy off or anything else. Um, I guess what I presented today is the easiest way from a clustering and algorithmic perspective to increase the confidence score. Like Putting the putting multiple URIs in the Shakespeare 100 field over and over again is an easier way to increase the confidence score of all of the sources mentioned in the, those URIs than to me just going to the engineers and saying like you can trust this source. But if you look at those ideas, you can see that all those ideas are included in each other's 
mark data. So why should we bother to add all those into the mark data? If, if programs can find those things automatically, <coughs> why take one thing? So, so can I add also that you're, you're also talking about different use cases, right? So, so right now, the use, our, our main use case for putting those URIs as mark and the graphic data is to is, is for conversion to RDF, and, and those subfield zeros are to help indicate the user display user interface. This is the label. This is the string label we want you to use. It's from this authority record, the subfield zero. So if we start, if so, so if we're to start putting in those multiple subfield zeros, then we're moving into another use case. And, and so, so we run into a question, and there are other use cases for that as well. There's already, you know, some, if you want to put multiple subfield zeros in there, then you can for authority control. Um, but then again, you're off to another use case. So I think one of the things that the library community has to determine, and I'm not sure we have, um, is what is our main use case for putting those subfield zeros into the big marker? Yeah. And I actually anticipated a question about this, like, the Jake's was, well, why, why should we do what's the benefit to libraries in your analysis? I can't answer that for you, but I can just say that it's really helpful to us. And the good of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> would, would that, so I'm, I'm thinking about putting multiple zeros in. Sorry. I'm, I'm thinking about putting multiple zeros in the, any authorized access point. Find out what, what would happen. Would, would, would we be able to, um, in our discovery layers, instead of only using it once for one label, let it have multiple instances based on whatever um, is out there in the link. I'm thinking about the um, multiple forms of the name and things like that. Couldn't, why would we limit ourselves to this one with many so our patrons could find serendipitously more about the thing we're trying to research? I'm just thinking that's not my head answer. Oh, I, I'm talking about right <laughs> 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 I wanted to say so one of the other things that went through my head was that this is all focused on mark data and adding yes. subfield zeros to mark data. And the big push of LD for P was to no longer produce mark data. So we considered it old format from the 1960s. We no longer want to use it. So what's going to happen, say, if one of us, let's say Stanford in a couple of years, no longer has any mark data for the artists, that everything is in our data. Do you adjust it now? Um, in, in that situation, we probably would not be listing multiple uh, identifiers for things. So that transition away from our is going to be happening pretty quickly. Yeah, that's another thing that is in the longer version of this presentation. Right now, we are only doing mark through books. Um, one of the reasons I'm here this weekend is to just kind of get the pulse on when everybody's going to be ready, and we'll be able to adjust whatever you give us. Um, we will have to write a custom parser. So I want to wait until it's a good steady state. Um, and the question I actually just had for Tom before this presentation is, are, are we going to be looking at side by sides of the mark data versus the different data? And like, is the different one generally, genuinely going to be better? So that's like the very first question we're going to start asking. If you guys start sending us RDF files or different files, I don't want to get rid of the mark files if the different can't fully replace.
Thank you. I just want to tell you a little bit about how I feel coming to this conference. Back in the late 70s when I was in high school, I got to go to a scholastic contest for typing. And I was the only kid with a manual typewriter. Anyway, hello from Texas. <laughs> connect our learners with the collection and keep our library relevant to the university. In my library, there is a feeling that the library is not valued as the integral center of the university. Our four-story building is merely prime real estate. I think other small to mid-sized university libraries may have the same problem. You and I and many other catalogers understand the benefits of linked data for our libraries. After all, we're, we've painstakingly created perfect records describing and representing the materials in our collections with the highest and noblest of principles. But what if it's all a huge waste of time? I know, I'm preaching to the choir here today. What if linked data was implemented to illuminate the rich legacy data in our collection for not only our learners, but learners all over the world who are interested in unique items in our collection? I know this is not a new idea here, it's why we are all here. But it is a new idea at my university and library. I want my colleagues to know that linked data can increase the value of our collection. A more valued collection can broaden the relevance of the library to our patrons and stakeholders. I've decided, I don't want to wait. I want to figure it out for my library. The problem is it's very technical and time consuming. And I've taken a bunch of webinars and attended conferences, heard from the Library of Congress, tried to read tons of articles and can mostly understand that linked data is already figured out. And the solution is people and money. This left me feeling deflated. It's not worth giving up on, though. There is something that can help. What's really missing is a sense of urgency for our decision makers. <clears throat> Maybe this traditional cataloger can have some influence regarding that. My library administration has been willing to let me spend time exploring linked data for our university. Our university administration emphasizes the strategic plan. I looked at two of the goals and realized linked data is a perfect fit. Well, talking about innovation and connections, that's what linked data is all about. So I thought the library could use it to help our students succeed. I hope to demonstrate how even the cataloging department can support the library's mission and the university's goals. How many of you have seen the movie, Charlie Wilson's War? Okay. Well, I chose to work on the congressional papers of U.S. Representative Charlie Wilson from our archives. His story was told in a book, and Tom Hanks portrayed him in the movie, Charlie Wilson's War. I am working on all of the other books and videos on this subject in our collection, the public library's collection, and the Charlie Wilson Oral History Project. Next, I took an introductory class on metadata and linked data, where I learned about the bib frame transformation tool, I called it the magic box, and found that I could get my MARC record into MARC XML in RDF syntax. And I got stuck. <laughs> All 
on where to put my data. I have since learned a little about Wikidata and GitHub, and I just got my own WordPress account. There are many librarians like me out there who want to start but don't know how because almost all of the literature is very technical. If you are writing, consider that your audience may not have a technical background. As development continues, the LD4 organization should continue to keep in mind the libraries or librarians with few resources. Thank you very much. create urgency. We need to help create a sense of urgency among the decision makers and stakeholders. Because, oh, there it goes. Because for me, the bottom line is that I want to connect our learners with the collection and keep our library relevant to the university. Thank you very much. <laughs> say more about uh, you got stuck, which was a great slide with a very good dramatic pause, <laughs> which I will try to emulate in the future. Um, with, uh, what about Wikidata? What about your ILS? What about WordPress? I mean, what are, what are your thoughts and what have you found not to work so far? Well, we have just lost, uh, last summer, we lost all of our library-specific ITS department to the university's ITS. So I don't have anybody to go to to ask um, so, um, I really didn't have any clue. I went to ALA midwinter and um, a nice librarian emailed me kind of confidentially and he said, why don't you try a, um, something like WordPress? So, um, my idea is to uh, figure out how to put the uh, six records that I have and see what that looks like, um, try to connect it to my library catalog in some form. I don't know exactly. If that doesn't work, I'll put my dad's photos on it or something. <laughs> um, thank you for repping your digital catalogers. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, you know, you talk about um, trying to get a sense of urgency with like upper ad to do this kind of work. Do you have any experience with um, maybe giving a sense of urgency to some original catalogers who might be kind of reticent to do this work and, and see that's going to point of it? Well, right now, um, I'm the only cataloger. Uh, the, the head of the department is retired, so, uh, and, sh and I was really only working on it anyway the past two years. So, um, I have the library administration on my side, um, but it's it's not anything. We we checked with uh, our, our ILS is Cersei Dynics, and we checked with them about their uh, Blue Cloud Visibility product, which is where you, you take our catalog uh, data and give it to Zephira, and they make it linked data <laughs> magically, I guess. Um, and we've got a quote on, or an, an informal quote of $25,000. Um, and uh, that's not going to happen in my university in that fashion, probably. At least I can't see it happening. So right now um, I'm starting to network in Texas and in other places where um, other librarians like me in small to mid-sized universities are wanting to at least learn, use the um, core competencies and figure out what this is all about and how we might be able to use it, apply it. Um, 
And I just think that the more cooperation we have, um, the more uh, uh, confidence we'll get. And eventually, I think things will happen to make, uh, you all are going to make things happen. <laughs> And uh, we'll have something to go on, and it'll be more mainstream. And then, our, you know, our university will um, see that it's a benefit.
collected, grouped in different ways in order for them to be more accessible, um, both to non-expert catalogers and um, to users. Now, this is related to another project of mine called Costume Core, which provides an application profile for metadata for historic clothing. So it's based on um, primarily VRA Core, Catalog and Cultural Objects, the AT, also the York County Fashion Thesaurus. So, once you go through all those grids in the app, um, you end up with something like this, um, seeing the different terms that you've applied. And then you can export the record um, to use the metadata in another context. So this is really designed to be platform agnostic, to be able to work with any number of other systems. Um, and for this project, we've also really focused on these um, fields, terms that are really specific to this kind of object. This would then also be able to be compatible to the kinds of, of data that we already more traditionally collect in terms of makers, dates, those kind of things. So we're working on a different, you know, all our different export formats there, um, and I think this topic was really helpful to hear um, Jesse's talk about what they're doing with Steam.org. Um, you know, this is one of our examples of a JSON-LD export um, with that idea of being able to contribute data back to the um, linked data ecosystem. Now, what you're seeing here is a work in progress, so it's really all kind of based on this costume core ontology. Doesn't yet reflect all the terms from the AT, et cetera, that we're using. So that will kind of be the next step to include those um, the direct links, in, um, those URIs instead of our CC URIs. Um, so yeah, so lots of research questions. Um, you know, the main ones being, um, you know, how this is um, useful in a variety of cases. Um, what level of specificity is really needed for a tool like this? Again, thinking of other kinds of visual materials that you can use this with. Um, how, you know, how does that tie in? Um, what different ways could exports be used? You know, we primarily think of it then being able to be imported into um, a content management system, but also thinking of use in, in um, classrooms and direct publication, sharing our linked data online. Um, but then most importantly, how do we achieve the critical mass of data collecting this kind of information to then make it worth developing um, ways of using this, digital, this visual workflow to then form a search query that it actually functions to help our end users to find the kinds of structural details like this that they're looking for, regardless of their vocabulary. So, I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Come find me to talk. We have some questions right now. You can also reach my uh, colleague, Mike Horton. Thank you. So I just first wanted to say this is really cool. This is really cool. Um, so but one of the questions that went to my mind is if it's all image based, have you thought yet about having sort of a having machine with the matching? So he a couple thoughts about that. I come to this personally, I come to this from a point of view as an educator. So the development of this tool was really first the idea of uh, it being a teaching tool a way of helping people to, to see how to do a close reading and really apply human <laughs> understanding to it. Now, that said, I know, you know, there aren't enough humans with enough time to really, you know, get this kind of really detailed data for the things that we would like to be able to have turn up in search. So I think the preliminary steps for um, human beings to use a tool like this helps to define what images, what, what um, the bots should be looking for um, for more automated search. So I think it, you know, it could lead very well into that process, but I think we need to do some more intellectual human work first. <laughs> How do your students know what linked data means and how, what kind of things they are going to create? Um, the short answer is 
well, at the start, certainly no. But I think that's um, you know, part of the potential here. And I think there are a couple different use cases. So you know, one of these is for um, more traditional catalogers who are working with collections that are not, you know, have, have some parts of their collection that are not bibliographic, which I've seen more and more at different institutions. Um, that they'll have this small collection of costumes in the archive or something that they need to describe. Um, so I think that's one value of it. And then I think for students that are creating metadata, and that's, again, the context that this came out of, um, I think that's a part of the education for them, is really showing them you know, the process, what this feeds into, and helps them become better consumers of data and metadata as well when they've been participating in the production of it, they un they're more critical of other collections that they see. So. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, Our next presenter is uh, Peter Babikonia, <laughs> and he is a head of research at uh, Coyos LLC, and he on the PhD from Princeton University, and he is a trained classical musician as well, and he has over 20 years of professional software development experience in uh, audio streaming, big data, and online advertising. And he worked at the Stacks at Northwestern University Music Library 40 years ago. And he still remembers uh, the, the classification number for the Beethoven's biography, which is ML410B. I really didn't know that. <laughs> more and more links, that's better. So just by 
by knowing nothing else, you can say, okay, that should raise my visibility if I'm involved with that. I'm going to speed up. So today's talk is about search optimization. They sort of view this from the point of view of search engine optimization. And uh, here's a dictionary definition of uh, search uh, engine optimization. And there's a guy running through, I don't know what it means. It's like a space just sort of emerges from the cloud. Why, why that face? Well, because he's closest to the camera. That's why. So Trey wrote this down, and boy, was this a head scratcher for me. He's like, the golden rule of SEO is satisfied users at request. But I, I didn't understand it when I first saw this. So he had to explain it to me. And because when I'm building a website, or if I want to promote a website, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking search engine optimization. How do I optimize my website so that it can enter into the rankings uh, on, on a Google search? That's my point of view as a developer. But it's not Google's point of view, right? Google's point of view is they want to show people advertising. And how do they do that? Well, by giving them stuff that they need, by giving them stuff that they ask for. So from Google's point of view, if you satisfy the user's request, you are, you get what I'm saying. Uh, we're going to divide SEO into components, what Google looks for, or what, if you read about this and do some experimentation, what it seems that they look for. So basically, I mean, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Four basic areas. Structure of your site, content of your site, linking, which is huge, and engagement. Here's an example page from a library that uses linked data. And it looks pretty good, actually. Uh, it has a picture of the book cover, has a description, it has a title, and it has a button that says how to get it. And from an SEO point of view, Google's point of view, you know, these people that are going to Google to get stuff, they're going to get stuff. So there's the button that says, okay, you can get it. Google's point of view, that's very good. And I've got to move along. So that's good. Okay, so now here's the four areas. Google Express structure, hierarchy, when it's crawling. If it comes to a website that is organized in a hierarchy, it can traverse it very easily and quickly and efficiently. If it's a tangled string like this, not so much. A tangled string, though, is a feature of linked data. So it's not going to work out so well if the site is organized that way. Uh, so more content. A lot of the... Uh, Vocabularies that I've read about, uh, you know, uh, work, expression, manifestation, item, people don't search. They don't say, I want 1984 manifestation. That doesn't happen. So there's a kind of a disconnect between what is presented in these uh, library pages and what people are actually asking for that uh, you might want to think about. Uh, engagement. I wrote this part to a problem, it all looks the same. That's not really very accurate. It has to do with localization. If you show somebody a book that's in a library 300 miles away, it's irrelevant, right? They want, from the SEO, I'm not talking about, you know, bibliographic research or anything like that, but just from SEO, giving people stuff that they're looking for, it has to be close by. And then there's links. So Google devalues artificially created links, and it weights links according to uh, its own criteria of authority, diversity, recency, and, and text matches. So some links going to your site count more than others. Something from the New York Times, that has big weight. Something from Susie's paper books, less weight. And a link back to itself doesn't count at all. So here are linking gotchas to think about. The same page for the same book on all kinds of different sites could be exactly the same. That's a gotcha. Google will 
compare the, the signal. It doesn't it? It's not unique. It doesn't provide value. Pages that have lots and lots of links. You know, Google will come and say, "That's too many links. I give up. You're, you're out of time." Basically, it has a time. Identical enter text, links later. Links created in reverse. That means that all the links to your page appear today, but then there's not added links. They're, they don't appear next week, next month. There's no evidence of, 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 of maintenance. And Google will say, oh, well, this is created by a machine, and it will depress the value. Um, so here's SEO success, what you can do for your site, for your pages, in order for Google to notice them better. Uh, at the top, you have uh, meta tags. You can put just by changing the language in your meta tags at the beginning, instead of the description being 1984 dystopian novel George Orwell, you can say, you can get 1984 here at your library. You can get it, action word, as opposed to just, you know, library talk. Site structure, as I mentioned, uh, the content, linking, engagement. Uh, okay, so these are the assertions that we just made, and I'm going, since I'm too much time at the beginning, and we're going to go through these three graphs, which basically show uh, implementation of linked data and uh, how the Google over the, over time. This is from 2016 through the end of uh, 2017. When Google figured out uh, libraries and implemented all this linking structure in order to attract attention from their crawler, and said, "Oh, we get it," and depress the value things. That's one slide, there's another, and there's another, which I'll be happy to show you later, but I think I'm out of time. So the conclusion really is if your goal is discoverability, then think like a consumer and perhaps push back a little bit against the logic that comes as a feature.
question. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about Eagle Eye and open science, and you probably haven't heard of Eagle Eye, but you'll find out about it now. Um, I am Julian Schneider. I have had many careers. I've been 20 years in the library biz, and I'm no longer in the library biz, but I still like it. I am the, an instructor and an instructor trainer for the Carpentries, and I am Har at Harvard Catalyst, and this is usually people's thought processes as I say these things. Um, it's mostly right, I'm not that interesting. Uh, but in, in 2009, a grant was gotten by Harvard and a few other people, and they decided to create a product called Eagle Eye. And Eagle Eye is a resource discovery system for research. Um, well, it's a discovery system for research objects. Because researchers have a problem. They cannot find the stuff they need to do their research. So people create um, reagents and antibodies, and they don't maybe register them. It's gotten better since 2009, for that part at least. And that should be a reagent, agent, but there's no reagent, reagent clip art. Um, they can't find the software they need. Instruments are very expensive, and they either have to spend a huge part of their grant on getting a new one, or try to find one that somebody already has. And it could be in the lab down the hall, but they will never know, because these things are siloed. And um, <laughs> transgenic mice are apparently a real problem, because PowerPoint doesn't even have a mice clip art, so I had to use a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> And so what Eagle Eye does is makes all of these things visible. We uh, describe them and put them in Eagle Eye, and then people can find out where they are. And it, at the time, it was incredibly glamorous. <laughs> and this is what it looks like now. It's pretty much stayed the same since 2009, and it's very stable. And one of the reasons it's stable is because it is uh, open platform, open access, ontology based, so it has a discovery type ontologies and ontologies that control the behavior of the information. So I have an ontology, which is the Eagle Eye ontology based on the Vivo ISF, uh, I can't remember what that actually stands for anymore, um, ontologies, and it's a triple store. And it's got this nice little skin in it. It's got the Google-like search box, because that was hot in 2009. And if you press the Go button, then you see all the filters, which makes me bonkers, because nobody knows you can do that. There's no indication that if you press the Go button and don't put anything in the box, you get a better search. <laughs> so it's one of the things I'd like to change. We have one of the biggest stem cell collections, uh, metadata. We don't store the stem cells, but we store the metadata for the stem cells. And we also had someone come up with a, an exchange facilitator tool built off of Eagle Eye so that people can go in, find their stem cell, and if they want to purchase it, this like, button link takes them directly to the sales page of whoever's selling the stem cell. This is what our records look like. Um, if you see something with the little blue circle with an eye, that comes from the descriptive tree of the ontology. So that's a term in the ontology, and if you hover over the I, you will get the definition of the term. Anything linked is linked to another resource type. So this is a web of links. It is a data grid. And the other thing that's interesting about Eagle Eye is we have an ontology browser. This, if you search Eagle Eye ontology browser, you can come up with it and look at it and it browses our entire ontology, but it also shows you what our data models look like. So this is the data model for software, and you can see all of the metadata fields, and I should have uh, captured this, but if you click on one of the metadata fields, you'll see what the URI is for that term. So you can find out what the URIs are for the actual metadata terms, as well as the URI for the resource type itself. What I find kind of funny about this is, this is from 2009, and I don't know if you've been around um, much of the science area lately, but there is so much talk about software sustainability, software um, description, software discoverability, because it's such a major part of research now. 
and I keep seeing uh, sustainability institutes, working groups, discussion groups, um, white papers, manifestos, and once you start hearing about manifestos, you know the funding's going to start coming in. <laughs> so it's going it's to be going important. That's actually only part of it. Here's the rest. So we we actually have a pretty rich uh, resource type model for software, among many other things. Here's our Sparkle endpoint. If you are that kind of person, um, I personally find Sparkle fascinating but terrifying. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it works, and sometimes I don't understand. Um, so now it's 2019, and what do we do with this? Uh, I just did um, an analysis of our nodes, which I forgot to mention. Eagle Eye is a distributed node network. When it first came up, they had about 50 different nodes across the U.S. and Puerto Rico. So you'd have an institution that had their own Eagle Eye node. They would take our free software platform and build it. They put all their stuff in. They controlled it. They had their own editing suite. But we have the Eagle Eye Central Search that searched all of the nodes. So you have all this data that you could find from all these places, but you only saw the one search interface. Um, so it worked really well, but it's been 10 years, and many times your funding goes away, the person who was the original advocate moves on, and either it doesn't get handed off, or the new person has a different priority, and so it just languishes. A lot of our nodes haven't been updated since 2016. Ours is because it's Harvard and I do it, and it's very rich and it's still very active. Um, but it does make me start to rethink, what are we going to do with this thing? Uh, we don't have, I don't have, uh, any funding for marketing or resources for development, which is probably why I'm stuck with that go button forever. Um, but the other interesting thing is that we're old news. We're 10 years old. And what I find so interesting is Eagle Eye was so far ahead of its time, because in 2009, open science was barely a concept. Nobody was worried too much about uh, permanent citations back then, or they were just starting to talk about it. Nobody was particularly worried about open research or reproducibility quite yet. So it was this thing that nobody quite knew why it was important, but now that it actually fulfills much of the requirements for openness and reproducibility, uh, we're old and everyone's forgotten, so we're like, oh, two ice birds, I miss. Um, because everything in the Eagle Eye has its own URI. Everything. So everything's permanent. Even if we withdraw a resource, we have a stub metadata record that's uh, findable through Google. Um, we could just say, oh, we farts, we're done, we're just going to sit there, and it's just going to stay there, and we're going to take all that work that was done and let it um, rot, but I think we have a lot we can do with this. We could start thinking about becoming true linked open data. Right now we're just an RDF. We don't really link out to things. So Wikidata is a possibility. Um, I could hide the sparkle and start thinking about how we use Eagle Eye for assessment. Because a lot of core facilities have all of their equipment services and software in Eagle Eye and we have, I think, eight or nine flow cytometry core facilities in there. They can do an assessment against their peers and see where they stand. But no one's going to do that sparkle voluntarily, so maybe I'll make it part of my job. Um, we could be a resource for data models. A lot of people are doing data models right now, and we've got a ton of them that are already there that nobody knows exists. Um, addressing workflow pain in the research cycle. Uh, core facilities are generally grant-funded units within uh, bioinformatics, biomedicine, medicine, uh, clinical medicine that provide services, provide a lot of genetic services, microscopic services, materials processing. And they have to prove they're, they're worthy of their existence or their funding goes away and they lose their jobs. So Eagle Eye could be a real um, way to prove that they are important and people are using their very expensive stuff. Um, that leads into trying to make Eagle Eye a better part of the skull comp cycle. We have URIs. We have a big old button that says cite this resource and it shows you what the URI is. Um, how do we get into those conversations? Especially for the core facilities who don't get attribution for what they do. You hardly ever see core facilities cited in a paper. 
Um, we also have all the things they used. They could put these URIs in the methods section of their papers, and their, their research could be incredibly reproducible because it tells you exactly what instrument and exactly what mouse and exactly what software you used. Um, the only problem is everyone's doing URIs. I'm, I'm having these nightmares of like massive crosswalks of URIs because <laughs> there's 14 for the same thing. Which one is the true URI? Um, and finally, we are developing a new product, and it's for educational resources. Um, Oregon Health Sciences University developed an educational resources ontology, and we adapted it to the Eagle Eye platform with only four code changes. And it still brought up the editor, the Sparkle uh, interface, and the ontology browser model perfectly fine. Functionality works. So, we are thinking, gee, we could adapt this to any disciplinary ontology, and here's the platform. Um, the platform is really hard to spin up, so I would love to containerize it. That's one of the things on my list to do. So that's what I'm looking for in 2019 from this 2009 triple store, not quite lit data project. The end. <laughs> about the you know 14 different URIs that are all for the same thing problem. Oh, uh, seems like it seems like you know then how many libraries are there in this country <laughs> or in the world? All of them publishing uh, you know BitFrame records as schema.org in JSON LD and hoping that Google will give their libraries version of it page rank. That's not. Yeah, I know. It's also a big problem with searching because if you're if you're just searching for ORCID IDs, you're going to totally miss all the other profiling URIs that are that are lurking out there. So mm -hmm. it's it's going to create a huge search problem for us. I mean, it's great they're persistent, but there's like a ton of persistent ones for the same thing. So I may have lost the thread. It's, you have URIs, but you're not linked data. Well, I guess I guess yes, we are linked data. I just don't think of it as linked data quite so much because we haven't really linked out to other things. We're like this self-contained little, you know, tool that um, just sort of links to itself in a sense. Um, for instance, we are we, we have we don't do date formats. I'm not sure. Well, I wasn't there when that decision was made. Um, <laughs> so we don't have, you know, we don't link. I, I don't link out to um, for people. I don't link out to buy it. I don't link out to LC. Um, that kind of linking out. We're not. We're only. We're not. We don't really exist as part of the greater data grid per se. So you're a cul-de-sac. Kind of, yes. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, have you, have you thought about what happens if you wanted to uh, basically freeze? Uh, no further development, no further updates to the data, but you still wanted the data to be live. What does that mean for maintaining the URIs? Where would those, what, on what web server would those exist? Uh, ours. <laughs> um, they're on our, this is all, this is all Harvard's, everyone is, everyone's is on their own servers. So when the server goes down, there goes the data. We have no control over anybody's but ours. So we would probably, you know, put a warm blanket over ours and put it in a corner somewhere um, so that it would exist as long as that existed. And, and I guess this is the real question is, as, every, as lots of institutions are thinking about standing up persistent URIs, what have you learned over 10 years about um, URIs, redirections, and maintenance that's not tied too closely to a technical platform that may shift? Yeah. Um, I'm finding that um, they go away quite a bit. When you're dealing with ontologies, they tend to go away. Um, we, especially when you're 
creating a new ontology using other ontologies. And we have some, um, there's a really great software ontology out there that got moved onto GitHub and there's a whole section of it with broken links and I'm not sure why it is and I, I need to alert them that that's happened but I just haven't had time. But I know, you know, at some point I have to, someone's gonna try to use that part of Eagle Eye and be like, ah, it's broken. So you, you're dependent on other people holding up their end of the deal. And I think that that's going to cause huge problems down the road. <laughs> because, I mean, really, it, how permanent is permanent? It's technology. <laughs> and, oh, sorry about the computer thing. <laughs> and thank you so much for all the presenters.